I'm Talithia Williams. I'm at Harvey Mudd College, and I'm excited to chat with you a bit today um, about how we might push past barriers and create a cultural mindset of data agency. Um, I'll also be sharing just a little bit of my background and then uh, talk about some things that I've been excited to do in the classroom with my colleagues. Um, I'd love to just sort of start out with my story. This is me in middle school, junior high school, and uh, you can find me there. I'll, I'll, I'll allow you to search, but um, on the second row. And I share this because, you know, I really grew up doing a lot of fun things like the drill team and uh, marching band, and I wasn't necessarily super math oriented um, at this time in my life. And so to sort of end up where I am today is not what was on my mind when I was in middle and high school. In fact, when I got to high school, I got a job as a cashier at a local grocery store. And, um, you know, one thing I loved about this job was that I was able to um, do mental math because that was back in the day when most people just paid with cash anyway. And so I did a lot of mental math um, trying to figure out what I owed folks, you know, what change I owed them before I could punch it into the cash register. And so um, my two years working as a cashier in high school really helped me work on my arithmetic in a way that I had not, you know, thought about, you know, being able to, oh, there it goes. What? Okay, you did it, Megan. Um, in, in a way that I had not been able to before. Um, I went to just a regular public high school in Columbus, Georgia, Columbus High School. And uh, this was at the time when AP classes were first coming out. And so like our school started offering AP classes and I started taking them because my teachers didn't really know how to teach it much different than a regular class. Um, I forgot we're recording this. I mean, I took it because I was disciplined and I wanted the challenge of that type of an education. That's, that's my official official statement. Um, but I took an AP calculus course. And um, one day after class, Mr. Dorman, my AP calculus teacher, he asked me to stay after class. And I was like, oh, he's obviously he's great at my exam. And, you know, he's about to tell me that I didn't do well. And, um, and he looks at me and he says, Talithia, you should think about majoring in math when you go to college. Um, and my first thought was, Obviously, he hasn't graded my exam yet, because once he sees it, you'll see that that's not a reality. Um, but also that he was so different from me. You know, here he is, this, this old uh, white guy who is like saying that I have math ability. Um, thank you, Noah. And, uh, and, and he was sort of affirming my math ability in a way that I hadn't really expected. Um, he actually did that for every student. At our 10-year reunion, we found out that like Mr. Dorman would be like, hey, Megan, let me see you after class. Hey, Nick, let me chat with you after class. So every student, he would affirm them and say, like, you should think about majoring in math when you go to college. Not if you go, but when you go. And that was really profound. In fact, it's something that I try to do in my classroom, like invite my students to the next course, invite them to take, you know, a course with me in the fall to really keep them plug in, plugged in, but to also let them know that I see them as mathematicians, no matter what their ability is. And so I think Mr. Dorman was able to do that for me. Another reason why it was so strange was because when I thought of a mathematician, I didn't think of anyone who looked like me. Like I didn't know any black women mathematicians. So the thought of majoring in math was very foreign for me. And it was something that I didn't really um, embrace until I actually got to college. I went to Spelman College undergrad. So uh, Mr. Dorman planted this seed and Spelman definitely helped to grow it and develop it. Uh, here I am with the late Dr. Etta Faulkner. Um, she was one of my uh, professors at Spelman and you know she was just amazing and and you know sort of this visible representation you know of what I could become and so Dr. Faulkner was the one who encouraged me to go to grad school and um I was reluctant you know if I'm honest I was just like this bachelor's degree is about to be great I'm so excited to finish this degree you know I minored in physics I was like I can do a lot with this Dr. Faulkner and it does not involve spending more time at someone's institution. And then she pulled up like a, a pay scale graph that had income by education level. And so it had like, if you had a high school degree, an associate's degree, a bachelor's, a master's, a PhD, you know, and it just sort of went up. It was like income over time. And I was like, ooh, like who are these people in this last group? Like, how do I get in this last group? Cause you know, who doesn't want to make a lot of money? Um, and she said, well, you should go to grad school. And so again, 
you know, I mean, my, my selfless motives. So just pure and for the love of the discipline, but it was also because I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll stay in school if that means I make more money over time. Um, she also shared with me that grad school is free when you major in STEM. So, you know, I also didn't, at that time didn't know that like, oh, well, if I go to grad school, who's gonna pay for that? How am I gonna live? Do I have to get a job? And so, you know, she really helped to dispel, you know, some of the myths that I thought about graduate school and um, made me see that it was more attainable than I actually thought. I started a PhD program at Howard University in pure math or theoretical math. Um, and I took a biostats elective course in the biology department. And it, I was just like filling out my schedule. I was just like, oh, there's nothing else that fits. Oh, there's this biostats. I didn't take stats at Spelman. I, did, I don't know why, but to this day, like I didn't take statistics at Spelman. Um, actually, Dr. Shaw, who's the stat professor at Spelman, she'll say I didn't take it because it was her teaching it and it was hard. And she's probably right. Like it was senior year and I was trying to be a senior. Um, and so I never took stats at Spelman. I took a biostats elective at Howard and fell in love with statistics. Like, I was just like, oh, this is great. I wanna, you know, do this. I remember we were looking at maternal um, health data and we were looking at the data set that has like uh, mothers and whether or not they smoked during pregnancy and then like, you know, gestation and baby's birth weight. And, um, you know, I think we were just doing basic linear regression. We did like a linear regression of this data set and it shows that for mothers who smoked, they had shorter gestation and lighter birth weight babies. And I'm just sitting here thinking like, what a duh, waste of time. You know, everybody knows that smoking inhibits the growth and development, you know, of, of your, your baby. Um, and so then the teacher starts to talk about how the tobacco industry fought against it. And, you know, they were like, no, it's not the cigarette smoke, it's not nicotine, it's genetics, it's environment. And I remember getting so infuriated as I was listening. I was like, well, if you just look at the data, it's obvious. Like, why would you, you can't refute this. The only difference in these groups of women are either women who smoked or who didn't, you know? And so that moment really pushed me to decide to switch to statistics. And so I transferred to Rice University to finish my PhD in statistics. Um, you know, it wasn't all gravy, you know, I, um, there were definitely challenges in joining a statistical community uh, where there, there weren't a lot of women of color. I mean, you know, we heard some of the data earlier um, that was uh, being shared. And I think you might've shared that um, just about like, you know, majors and, you know, majors of color in stats and, and math. And getting to graduate school, I was the only woman and the only African-American in my cohort. And so it was definitely at times a really lonely experience to, to kind of find community. Um, I remember going to conferences and like being asked if I was in the right place or can I see your ID or, oh, can you please refill the coffee? And so there are all these moments where I, I found myself thinking like, is this really the community that I want to be a part of, you know, and are they you know, really welcoming me into this, this space or do they sort of see me as other or, um, you know, are you lost? And, and, of course, and nobody was like mean about it, but it was just, you know, the first thought I felt like often when someone saw me was, are you sure you're in the right place? Or, you know, uh, can I help you get where you're going? Because it must not be this like stats exhibit hall kind of thing. Um, it was also challenging to build study groups. You know, when you think about what makes you successful as a student, whether it's undergrad or grad school, um, building a study group and having a strong grad school study group is a part of it. Um, but being in some ways an outlier from the other guys in my cohort, um, that was really a challenge for me, you know, to, to really try to build these bridges and make these connections when they sort of already had this, this connection among them. And so um, I'm happy to share more about that, of course, if you have questions, but uh, that's a whole, that, this could be a whole another talk. Um, but I graduated, I finished my PhD in stats, and uh, here I am up top, you see, with my uh, advisor, Dr. Kathy Inzer, who's currently the president of the American Statistical Association, so I'm super proud of her. Um, we saw each other a few weeks ago at the INFORMS conference in Houston, so I put that picture up there as well, because it's so great to be able to keep in touch with her and just... Um, and, and check in with her. And you'll see that we had a, a two week old in tow. So I guess it was a really productive uh, graduation there. Baby came out, PhD, uh, we did a lot of things. 
Um, I spent some summers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I worked in this guy's lab, Dr. Lonnie Lane, and we did the Europa, worked on the Europa mission. Um, my, this was my first sort of research experience. This was during the summer of some of my undergrad years at Spelman. And what I loved about being in Lonnie's lab is that he invited all of his summer students to the table. Like he really felt like because we were new and because we hadn't been inundated with what they were doing, we would come with these really fresh ideas. And he was right. Um, the, this, this mission is actually still happening. It's, it's supposed to take place in October of 2024. So it's fun to see something that I got to work on for three summers, like now actually come to fruition. I also spent some time at the National Security Agency uh, while I was a graduate student. I really wanted to sort of see what research mathematicians and in industry do. And um, this was a great way for me to serve. Uh, I had to get you know, like top secret security clearance. And so that was a fun process to go to and, you know, take a polygraph lie detector test. Um, but I really enjoyed my time at the, at the NSA as well. And, um, and it just gave me sort of a different view of, of research and, and doing research in government. Currently, I'm on the faculty at Harvey Mudd College, not far from Pomona, where Joe Harden is, who just spoke. And so she's my, my local colleague. And you'll see uh, a lot of my colleagues. This was our most recent department picture, our Zoom photo um, that we took earlier this year. And so um, uh, here you just see the, this is my class, class of 2021. Harvey Mudd's a small STEM school. So uh, we only have six majors that are all STEM majors. Uh, so math, chemistry, physics, biology, computer science, and engineering. And, um, and so the, the classroom experience is, is very intimate. You know, classes aren't usually larger than about 30 students. And so it really is an environment to help um, develop students and develop their mathematical and, uh, and their statistical ability as well. And then here's my family. This is actually an older picture. My goodness, my boys are getting so big. I got to update this. So this is in our backyard out in California. Um, in addition to you know, my work as a, as a professor, I got the opportunity to partner with PBS and NOVA, which is their science documentary arm to host um, one of their shows called Nova Wonders. This came out, um, gosh, it has been four years, uh, four years ago. Um, and this was really exciting because uh, this was a six episode series. So each episode was about an hour long. And it tried to tackle some of the big, biggest questions on the frontiers of science. What are animals saying? What's living in you? Can we build a brain? What's the universe made of? And underlying all of these questions and all the work that researchers were doing was is data, honestly. And so uh, we were all, we often found ourselves on screen talking about data and how it's used to solve each of these problems. And so uh, it was really great as a statistician who was also uh, one of the co-hosts for me to be able to talk about that and um, as a part of my discipline. And so that was really fun. Um, it was very different from my job as a professor. You know, when I'm in the classroom, my students sort of have to stay. Like they can't just be like, this lecture sucks, I'm walking out. And so on screen, however, um, they would be, you know, they would like hold up their hand and do this, which meant like they were clicking away and they'd be like, Talithia, we're about to click away from you. Cause like, you are just making this sound, you know, monotonous. And so I really had to be like energetic and animated. I don't know if any of you that have seen any of the shows. Um, the top right picture there is me doing voiceover. And then even in the voiceover, I'm like trying to be energetic and, and animated. I think it also changed the way that I teach though. I think it does make me try to bring my students in and, and get them really excited about the, the math and the statistics that they're learning in the classroom. We taped in the in Boston. That's where uh, PBS, uh, where Nova is is headquartered and based. And so we taped in the design district in Boston. And then they did a lot of graphics in the background, which you see in the top picture. So I remember walking in thinking, like, we're gonna do a science documentary in this space, like, really. Um, and so I brought a clip for you. Inside a human brain, there's about a hundred billion neurons. Each one of them can connect to 10,000 others. And from these connections comes everything. <laughs> the human brain can compose symphonies, create beautiful works of art. It allows us to navigate our world, to probe the universe, 
and to invest technology that can do amazing things. Now, some of that technology is aimed at replicating the brain that created it, artificial intelligence, or AI. But has it even come close to what these babies can do? For ages, computers have done impressive stuff. They crack codes, master chess, operate spacecraft. But in the last few years, something has changed. Suddenly, computers are doing things that can seem much more human. Today, computers can see, understand speech, even write poetry. How is all this possible? And how far will it go? Did we actually build a machine that's as smart as us? One that can imagine, create, even learn on its own? How would a machine like that change society? How would it change us? I'm Rana el -Kaliubi. I'm Andre Fenton. I'm Talithia Williams, and in this episode, Nova wonders, can we build a brain? And if we could, should we? Yay! Um, we definitely cannot build a brain, or should we probably try to? Um, uh, gosh, in 2014, I gave a TEDx talk. So at the local Claremont Colleges here, one of my students was, thank you, Maha, um, was on the local organizing committee. And so she invited me to, to give a talk. The theme was storytelling. And at first I remember thinking like, I do data, I do stats, I don't tell stories. And so I'm not sure how I could really contribute anything meaningful to a TED talk with a theme of storytelling. Um, but after chatting with some colleagues, we sort of came up with the idea of how we can use data to tell stories. And so this, uh, this um, TED Talk, Own Your Body's Data, was birthed and, uh, and, and given at the TEDx event and then kind of upgraded to a TED Talk. And so uh, from there, though, it's given me a lot of opportunities to be in front of the public and to talk to them about data and statistics and data science and um, to really get them excited about STEM um, in a way that I didn't know about, you know, growing up as a young girl. And so that's been a real treat for me as well. I also authored this book, Power in Numbers, The Rebel Women of Mathematics, even though I don't think they were really rebelling, but the, um, the publishers were like, oh, I think rebel will sell. Um, I wanted it to be subtitled Women Mathematicians with Attitude, like ADD ad attitude. Yeah, exactly. Very punny. I thought it was punny, but they did not think that would be very punny. So rebel women it was. And so in this book, I highlight a lot of the women that I really would have loved to know when I was growing up. I would have loved to, to get to know these women and what they did in the mathematical sciences. Um, Winifred Merrill is one of the women who's highlighted. She's the first woman to get a PhD in math. And um, she graduated from Wellesley and, and got accepted to the PhD program at Columbia. And initially, they didn't want to accept her because they didn't accept women, but you know, she had all these qualifications and she petitioned to get accepted on the condition that she could not take classes with the other guys. So she basically did like an independent study. She got the syllabus and the book and she had to learn all the material on her own and take the exams. Um, she finished her coursework, she did her thesis, she defended her dissertation and still had to petition to get the degree because the board said, well, we don't wanna be the first institution to give a PhD in math to a woman. Um, and so after she finally got her petition approved, she graduated and this momentous occasion was highlighted in the New York Times. But notice what they said about her. They mentioned what she was wearing, right? She was modestly dressed in a walking dress of dark brown stuff trimmed with velvet. Um, and I was, and I, as I was looking up these women and their amazing lives, you could also see how, you know, she did this amazing monumental first and yet the conversation was still around, but what did she have on? Like what, what kind of designer dress was that that she wore? Um, another uh, women, woman that I feature is uh, Eugenia Chang. Here you see her on the Stephen Colbert show. And so she's also done a lot of work around making mathematics accessible and exciting to a new generation. Um, I love this quote where she says, you know, it's not about memorization or getting about 
uh, the right answer that mathematics and statistics is really about exploration and investigation. And um, the way that I think we can excite the next generation is really helping them see um, the beauty and the fun and the excitement that comes in math and statistics and data science and not just sort of the rote memorization that comes with it. Another one of the women that I highlight is uh, Katherine Johnson, the late Katherine Johnson. And um, of course, she was one of the hidden figures. For any of you that saw the movie Hidden Figures, you can give a thumbs up uh, if you saw that movie. Perhaps one of the calculations that she's very famously known for is for the Apollo 13 mission. Um, shortly after this crew took off, they noticed um, uh, the oxygen tank actually exploded. And so they lost. Uh, so power was declining, water and oxygen was declining. And so all of their effort went into figuring out how to get back to earth as quick as possible. And so Catherine was the one who came up with the calculations and the idea to harness um, the gravitational pull of the moon as a slingshot. And so she said, hey, if you go close enough around the moon, the, the gravitational pull will pull you around. You can save some momentum, save some gas, and it'll almost slingshot you back to earth. And so her calculations were, um, you know, really what helped us move forward in the in the space race. Her calculations and what was done by many of the women who worked in the back room as as computers. Below there, you see an image um, from the command room, and many of those images, all of those images, in fact, um, are of men. You rarely see women in those spaces, and yet they were uh, a huge part of the space race. Uh, we found some pictures of women working in the background as computers. And by computers, it meant that they were really doing all of the mathematical calculations. And so that was really exciting to see where women were showing up in this, this, this process. Um, the movie Hidden Figures is based on the lives of African-American women who worked as NASA's human computers during the space race. And this was really a time when it was like all hands on deck. We really wanted to come together as a nation, as a country to, to beat Russia to the moon. And so um, regardless of your race or your gender, it was just talent that brought us to the table. And so this was really uh, a great time, um, a proud time, I think, in our history. And for those of you that haven't seen the movie, I brought a clip to show with you now. Here you go. So we have the vehicle speed, the launch window, and for argument's sake, the landing zone is the Bahamas. Should be enough to figure the go, no go? Yeah, in theory, sir. We need to be past theory at this point. We'll be able to calculate a go, no go with that information. When exactly is that going to happen? Catherine? Go ahead. The go point for re-entry is 2,990 miles from where we want Colonel Glenn to land. If we assume that's the Bahamas, 544 miles per hour, 46.56 degrees, 2,990 miles. Okay, so that puts your landing zone at 5.0667 degrees north, 77.3333 degrees west, which is here. Give or take 20 square miles. I like your numbers. <laughs> um, I, um, that scene always freaks me out. It reminds me of like my, my oral defense um, or for my oral part of the qualifying exams. So I was just like, you know, doing stats and uh, on the board and, and in front of my profs at Rice. Um, uh, and so in response to really thinking about how to inspire and motivate and encourage the next generation of data scientists of, you know, of Katherine Johnson's, uh, when I got to Harvey Mudd, um, I noticed that there were very few students of color. I think we had five black students total, like freshmen through seniors. Um, and we're in Southern California. And so I wanted to figure out a way to, you know, increase the pipeline of women of color who were coming to MUD and going into STEM fields in general, but also just, just help them see themselves as um, people who, who, who can do and are capable of having a career in STEM, regardless of, of the path that they choose. And so I started an annual conference for women and girls of color um, 
in STEM. And so this ended up being a, a, a one day sort of all day workshop conference where girls come to Harvey Mudd's campus and do fun things. Um, they do workshops. They, we have like keynote speakers, um, they get mentored. Um, and so some of this work has been written up. Uh, we were featured in Forbes magazine some years ago for the work that we do to help increase educational opportunities for minorities in STEM. And so some of my high school girls got featured there. Um, we usually bring about 150 or so local girls to campus. And for many of these girls, it's their first time being on a college campus definitely being on our campus. And so even just getting in the habit of feeling like you can come to a college and be a part of this uh, experience is, is amazing for them. Uh, for each of those Saturdays that we do the conference, we um, often have some activity where the girls are in this space and command this space and sort of speak out in the space. And so I think for this particular year, um, the question was, um, what's your inspiration equation, right? So what's a fun way to come up with the things that inspire you and how do you put that in an equation? And, you know, why do you give certain weight to certain things? And so that was really fun. We also have started to partner with some of our alums. So getting some of our women alums to come back and talk about how they currently use STEM in their careers and if there are opportunities for any of our girls to participate in. And so that's been a really great connection um, to connect with alumni and, and keep them plugged into the college as well. And then we give these um, small group session times where you know we'll have our, our our mentors share have our girls ask any kind of question because often some of the questions they have are not questions that they want to bring to their parents um some things that come up are like well for girls that are in ap classes you know they don't get asked to the prom or like they're seen as the nerdy girls and like how can i be smart and also have a prom date you know and so um, it's really great to provide this outlet and to help them build community and see that there are other girls just like them who are brilliant and excited to do things in STEM. The first year that we did the conference, we didn't really anticipate anything for parents. We thought they were just gonna drop their kid off and then like head home and you know, like we'll see you at three o'clock when, when it's time to pick up. But many of our parents hung around. Um, they were, you know, they weren't really comfortable just leaving their daughter on a college campus that was foreign to them. And so what we started doing the second year is a parent workshop. So while the girls were in sessions, we invited in outside uh, guidance counselors from the local um, Claremont High School. We had special speakers for our parents. And so that was really great because all of a sudden now parents were coming and staying and engaging. We gave them a lot of tools on how to help their daughter, especially in their math courses. So we would do this reenactment where it was like, okay, your daughter comes home and she's got a question, you know, from her math class, from her stats class, how do you respond? And often their response was, I don't know how to do that. And I'm still successful. You'll be fine. You know, don't worry about it. And we were like, that is not what you say, you know? And so just giving parents tools because often, you know, some parents haven't taken AP calculus or some of our girls are first gonna be first gen. And so they didn't have parents who could just help them uh, with all of their math homework. And so we tried to give them resources and tools and also help the parents form a community as well. Um, more recently, I have been taping during COVID, uh, the new show Zero to Infinity, which um, really kind of helps us understand uh, the origins of zero, why is zero so important, and what is infinity, how do we quantify infinity, how can we think about infinity, and so this has been really a fun show to tape, uh, this will be an hour long episode that I get to host, and so I've gotten to interact with a lot of um, mathematical scientist. Uh, here I am with Steve Strogatz, who's spending a year at MoMath in New York. And so we did a session on making pizza. We made pizza in his New York apartment. And then um, we talked about how, if you have the shape of a circle, how would you come up, determine the area of a circle? You know, if you didn't know anything about pi or anything like that, how could you figure out the area of a circle? And one way that you could do it was to cut it into slices and rearrange those slices into a parallelogram. And if you did this an infinite amount of times, you would end up with a rectangle, which the area is linked times width. And so this has been really great too, because you know, when you think about like how do you, how do we 
um, share these mathematical ideas with the general public in a way that gets them excited about it and gets them wanting to learn more. Um, I learned a lot about that while I was taping the show. And also just while I was, you know, meeting different people from around the country, um, Eugenia Chang and I did a session together. I got to go to um, an astronomy lab and, and look out at space. Often when we think about infinity, people think about space and is space infinite and tackle some of those questions as well. And so that's been a really fun time for me. Um, oh, here's another video. The Orange County Fair held in Southern California. In theory, these crowds hold a predictive power that can have startling accuracy. But it doesn't belong to any individual only the group, and even then it has to be viewed through the lens of mathematics. The theory is known as the wisdom of crowds, a phenomenon first documented about a hundred years ago. Statistician Talithia Williams is here to see if the theory checks out, and to spend some time with the fair's most beloved animal, Patches, a 14-year-old ox. It was a fair, kind of like this one, where in 1906, Sir Francis Dalton came across a contest where you had to guess the weight of an ox, like patches you see here behind me. After the ox weight guessing contest was over, Galton took all the entries home and analyzed them statistically. To his surprise, while none of the individual guesses were correct, the average of all the guesses was off by less than 1%. That's the wisdom of crowds. But is it still true? Here's how I think we can test that today. What if we ask a random sample of people here at the fair if they can guess how many jelly beans they think are in the jar? And then we take those numbers and average them and see if that's actually close to the true number of jelly beans. Guess how many jelly beans are in here? Come on, guys. Everybody's got to have a guess. I see your mind churning. 1227. 846. Probably like 925. There you go. So just write your number down. Uh huh. There you go. <laughs> the 135 guesses gathered from the crowd vary wildly. The range of our guesses was from the smallest was 183. The largest was 12,000. So you can tell <laughs> folks were really guessing. But when we take the average of our guesses, we get 1,522. So the question is, how close is our average to the actual number of jelly beans? Well, now's the moment of truth. All right, so the real number of jelly beans was 1,676. The average of our guesses was off by less than 10%. So there actually was some wisdom in our crowd. Though off by about 10%, the average of the crowd's estimates was still more accurate than the vast majority of the individual guesses. Even so, the wisdom of crowds does have limits it can be easily undermined by outside influences and tends to work best on questions with clear answers, like a number. The steps to Lithia <laughs> took reflect a process going on all around us these days in the work of statisticians. Thanks, everybody. So we collected this data, right? we analyzed it mathematically, and we got an estimate that was pretty close to the actual true value. That's math and statistics at work. <laughs> I love that. Um, Eric, the reason we didn't have people try to guess the weight of the ox was that we didn't think that people like intuitively uh, would have a grasp of that. Like, you know, back in, in um, Galton's time, you know, you, you would sort of know like, oh yeah, I want a small ox, a, a large ox, but we just thought people wouldn't even know how to sort of get, you know, have a good guess for it. Whereas like a container of, uh, you know, a container of jelly beans is something that people would be, have more intuition for and could give better guesses. So that was why we didn't. Um, 
Great, great, great. Okay. Yes. I did not have to eat all of them. It was so cool. And yes. Thank you, Eric. Absolutely. Yeah. People knew much more about oxes back then. Um, I can't tell you what the weight of an ox is. Um, last thing I'll end on and then open the floor for, for questions um, is some tools and strategies that I've done in the classroom to try to make data science really more culturally relevant. Um, much of this you know, has led to trying to think about how to redesign current courses, especially intro courses, in a way that keeps students motivated. Um, also keeping in mind sort of what's changing around us in society, you know, with, with COVID-19, um, people are really much more open and sharing their health data. And, um, you know, not just as a country, but as a world, and how we might use that health data to really um, better support outcomes. And so there's a paper by the National Academy of Medicine that talks about effective use of data sharing. Um, but in, in thinking about my students and also thinking about how different groups in society accept or share their data or even um, might be reluctant to say take a vaccine or excited to take a vaccine. You know, these are some of the questions that I want to pose to my students because I want them to be thoughtful as they step out into society of what impact their decision, their scientific decisions are going to have on society. And so I remember in talking with my mom about um, the COVID-19 vaccine, I'm like, whoa, it's available, mom. Do you want me to go online and make your appointment? She was like, well, I don't know. You remember Tuskegee? And I was just thinking like, no, I don't remember Tuskegee. What happened at Tuskegee? And so, you know, my mom began to share with me, you know, some of her reluctance initially in taking the vaccine because of what happened in Tuskegee. Um, Tuskegee, Alabama, uh, there was a syphilis experiment that was done on black men and Tuskegee is right next to Georgia, uh, Columbus, Georgia, where I grew up. It's probably a 40 minute drive. And so we knew a lot of families uh, in Tuskegee. And, um, this officially was called the study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male, and it started in 1932. It was an experiment where um, the study offered meals and uh, free meals, free checkup, but never explained that they would be subject to, uh, you know, being infected with syphilis and, and treatment would be withheld. And so uh, many folks in the African American community remember this experiment and, and um, it has rooted some of the distrust that they had in terms of whether or not to take the vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine. A little bit of the history here, because this may be new for, for some of you. Um, this experiment involved 600 Black men, about 400 of them, 399 with syphilis, uh, 201 who did not have the um, disease. And, but they didn't have any informed consent. So it wasn't like, we're gonna do this experiment on you. Do you agree? It was, it was that was withheld from them. Um, they were told that they were being treated for bad blood and in exchange for being a part of the study, they'd get free medical exams, free meals, and they get burial insurance. Um, and so 11 years later, penicillin came out as a treatment of choice for syphilis. It was widely available. Um, it was very effective, but these participants were not offered treatment. Now, this is 11 years later, right, burial insurance. Like, that should have been like, what? Wait a minute. Um, and so it wasn't until 1972 that the Associated Press broke the story. Okay, so notice we're 40 years later, 40 years after the start of this study, the Associated Press was like, wait a minute, mm, why are we still like experimenting on these men and not giving them treatment for a, a uh, illness that is curable or you know i mean is treatable um the following year there was a class action lawsuit filed on their behalf um and it settled out of court for 10 million which sounds just minuscule i guess that was that was probably a lot back then but still just feels like it should have been so much more for something that was sanctioned by the u.s government um president former president bill clinton issued a formal presidential apology and it was only it was in this current you know, uh, millennium to 2014, I'm sorry, 2004 and 2009, that the last study participant died. And there are still children who are, who are living today who had a, a, a father who was a part of this experiment. And so when we think about um, how data is, is interpreted and trusted in different communities, we have to also think about why a group's mistrust might be rooted in what has happened to them in the past. And so this is helpful to talk about, especially with my students, because sometimes if you just look at the news and say, well, why is it that people aren't color, of color aren't getting vaccinated? That doesn't make sense. Um, it helps to just have the whole story of what might be leading to some of that mistrust. Um, but there's also hope, you know, uh, Dr. Kizmikia Corbett has been on the front line. She was one of the researchers who um, 
was heavily involved in coming up with the COVID vaccine. And so I know in the African-American community, um, you know, she has been highlighted that, you know, that this is work that is coming from our community uh, that is safe for us to, to take and that has been even um, done by someone in our community. And so uh, it does help to have these diverse perspectives, not just at the table, but also at the research table as part of the solution so that um, as it gets, you know, as these things that we do become public and get laid out for the public, the public will embrace those as well. In the classroom, the way that I sort of translate this into like, what does this look like in an intro prop stat course? Uh, my colleague, Prop Susan Martinosi and I recently revamped our final project for our intro prop stat um, class. And so we really wanted our students to look at a data set that was gonna challenge them to think about equity issues, think about impacts on society, think about disproportionate impact among different groups because they will be the ones who are making these decisions or living in communities that are affected by these decisions. And we wanted to really um, help inform them. And so we decided to look at the New York stop question and frisk data set and have our students analyze this very rich data set. Uh, stop question and frisk was a policy in New York um, in the 2010s. And it allowed a police officer to stop anyone you know, um, who they suspected could be carrying a weapon, could be carrying contraband and search and frisk them without any, any cause necessarily. And when you look at the data, when my students looked at the data, what they noticed was if you look at the proportion of say blacks in New York, that's about 23%, they represented 53% of the stops. Um, likewise for white Asian and Native Americans, around 43% of the population were 13% of stops. And then for Latinos, 29% um, of the population and about 33% of stops. And so we wanted our students to dig into this data set. You know, is this, um, was the policy effective, you know, um, and just look and see was, is there bias in this data, what they might notice. One thing that they were able to generate was looking at stops by precinct. So if you look at the concentration of stops by precinct, sort of the lighter the blue, the fewer the stops, and the redder you get the more uh, stops. And then if you look at the diversity of different precincts, you'll notice a few things. You'll notice that for areas that are, um, that lots of stops happen, say here in north uh, of Staten Island, which has a much more uh, diverse population, um, more stops tend to happen in that area, right? So in very diverse communities, Brooklyn, for example, um, you see a lot of stops. And so we wanted to look at that, you know, why is it that there are, uh, most stops happen in very uh, Hispanic or African-American leaning neighborhoods and others don't experience as many stops as, as they do. Um, this data set is rich. One of the things that my students pulled out was the period of observation. So this is how long does an officer look at you before they decide, you know what, let me stop and frisk that person because you just never know. And it's in minute and notice about a thousand stops are one minute. So that means an officer looked at you for a minute and decided I wanna stop them. You see those typical rounding peaks, right? At five and 10 and 15 and 20 minutes, which, um, you know, are likely not accurate, right? Because, you know, if I say I got to fill out a form, how long did I look at somebody? It was about five minutes, oh, about 10 minutes. Um, but notice here that there is really not a lot of time that officers are giving themselves to look at someone and making a, judge, a judgment about what they're doing and whether or not they might have a weapon. And so it also begged the question of what is leading you to make this judgment? And so then I'd ask my students, you know, hey, let's look around this classroom. And in the next 50 seconds, I want you to pick out somebody to stop and frisk. Like I've given someone a, a, a weapon, who has it? And see if you can look at them and, and determine. And it's sort of this awkward moment because you can't really look at someone and be like, I think they have the weapon, even though I've told you that someone in the room has one, right? Um, and so often what's motivating it looked to be and, and looking at the data was a bias against certain groups. And so my students were able to pull that out. Was the law effective was one of the questions that they're tasked with. And when you look at what proportion of stops actually ended up finding a weapon or finding contraband, it's less than 10% of the stops. And in fact, the highest area was Manhattan, which is the, you know, the least diverse area of the city. Um, when officers did stop someone was where they were most likely to find a weapon or, or, or contraband. And so it meant that a lot of their stops, you know, were on innocent people who felt like they were being, um, you know, assumed guilty by the police before having to be proven innocent um, after a search. 
we actually, I had a student who uh, one year was from New York and a, a young African-American student. And he said he'd been stopped twice. He was in this data set twice. And we were just sort of like, really? You know, and so the, you know, your first response is, well, what were you doing? Like, how did you get stopped by the police? You know, um, cause this was sort of like a Steve Urkel looking good, looking student. Like if you, if you remember the show, you guys probably don't remember the show, but if you remember the show, Steve Urkel was like nerdy, stereotypical nerdy, um, black kid, tall, skinny, that kind of kid. And so um, he tells us the story. He said, well, I was, I had math club after school. We're like, yep, math club. Yes, you would be there. Check. You know, um, he said, we got, we had snacks uh, after math club. We were like, okay, yep. You got to eat. If you're going to use your brain. Yes. Snacks. He said, it was my turn to get snacks. We're like, great. Uh, he said, I went to the cafeteria. I got snacks. I came back with like chips, soda, candy. I'm walking with these bags from the cafeteria and it's in New York, right? So schools are like right downtown. And he said, the police pull up and they say, where did you steal that food from? And he was just like, oh no, I just got this. I'm going to math club. These are our snacks. And they were like, no, really? Like now we know you stole it. Like, of course you're not going to math club. And so they followed him. They had to like, he took them to math club. And so, you know, he walks in and all his friends are just like, what in the world? And so his friends were the ones who were like, yep, he's here. He was just bringing snacks for math club. And so it was really a sensitive moment in the classroom because all of a sudden, like, here's your classmate who's in this data set for something that likely you did math club after school and snacks. And yet in this moment, he was just embarrassed. He said he felt humiliated. He felt like his voice didn't matter because he told them the same thing. He said, no, these are for math club. I'm walking that way. And it was like, no, it's not until I, not until they heard it from his white counterparts. Did they believe it? It was like, oh, okay. Well, if you guys say he's legit, then you know, but there was no apology. There wasn't, we're sorry. The first thing we thought was that you stole it. It was just like, hey, we're just doing our job protecting the city from people like you. And so um, I always share that story when I teach uh, the class and when we go into this, because I want them to feel a connection to it. I don't want them to think, oh, it's those people in New York City who are affected. No, it's your classmates who may be from New York, or it's the fact that this policy is on the table by the current mayor to come back as something that benefits the city's safety and it, it's been proven that it did not benefit them at all. Also, if you look at the distribution of age, these are all graphs that my students generated. Um, you can see sort of who is most likely to get stopped by age. And so my students did a lot of statistical analysis on that by gender, by age, by race, and who is, is likely to be stopped. And so I'll just end on a couple of notes um, for this class, just in terms of the makeup of it. We use R in our studio. A lot of my students do R Markdown. We do the Open Intro Statistics book, which I love and I highly recommend. Uh, it has all the R code, it has R labs, it has lectures. And so there's a link there, but you can easily sort of Google that if that's something that you're interested in. It's been great. We also have a few institutional barriers. One is just thinking about, you know, for those of you who are at different institutions, if this is something you'd want to incorporate, um, is there support for that? You know, is there a course release time to sort of redevelop a course to make it more equity centered? Um, are there tech, do your students all have access to different technology resources to do R in our studio? Is there funding to support it? We run into the issue of having sufficient faculty to teach it. Um, I'm the only, the lone statistician officially on staff at Harvey Mudd in the math department. And um, typically Susan and I are always teaching it, but you know, the year we were both on sabbatical, it was just like, what are we gonna do for intro prop stats? And um, often when colleagues teach it, they may not want to use our resources. And so really kind of making sure that we make it a part of the culture and that this is the way that we teach this course, no matter who is teaching it. And then of course, connecting it to our mission and um, helping our students see that it is their responsibility and their duty to be thoughtful about how data is impacting society and the role that they have in it. So thank you so much. I will stop share here and just open the floor for questions. So thank you. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, we're getting some questions coming in and the Q&A. I have one quick question for you. Yeah. When you were writing your book, uh, The Power and Numbers, what surprised you? What was one of your surprises? Ooh, um, surprised me. You know, I was really surprised at how 
for, for many of the women, especially in, in, in previous generations, their family was just not very supportive of them studying math, studying STEM. It was like, who's gonna marry you? Nobody wants a wife who's smart, you know? Wow. Um, and so just to sort of read some of those stories, how in, you know, in spite of maybe not being supported by family, they studied this thing that they were passionate about. Um, that was really sort of a, a shocker for me uh, to hear many of the challenges that, um, some of the first black women went through when they were getting PhDs. And so there were of course challenges for, for women who broke the barrier and then women of color who were breaking these barriers. It was also really challenging because um, there, there were these unsaid rules. Like, you know, at, at least for Winifred, it was like, women do not do this, women do not do that. You know, like here is like the rules are in place. Um, once it was co-ed, there wasn't a rule that black women aren't allowed in this study group or black women aren't allowed to work with so-and-so, but those were in place anyway, right? And so it was sort of like, no, you're here. You're just like any other student. Um, but in reality, their experience was very different. And so that was really um, enlightening for me to see that in spite of that, you know, they would find professors who would want to work with them and, and want to um, get them their degree. And then often the undergrad institutions would send people to work with that person. They'd be like, okay, so-and-so at this place wants to, you know, like, work with black women in math, like go and be, you know, his PhD student. And so I definitely felt that when I got to Spelman and once Dr. Faulkner was like, okay, grad school, I'm like, great. So she's like, okay, here's where you can apply. She was like, here's the list. <laughs> we already have people in place at these places. And so even in 2000, wow. it was sort of like, all right, like, cause we, and here's where you're not gonna go. Here's where we're not gonna send you because we've sent folks there um, that have not been taken care of. And so just the fact that you, you know, there are these hidden norms right. that you have to understand in order to be successful. Um, and and that, that in some ways is still true today. Thank you. Uh Oh, that's a great yeah. question. Yeah. Oh, do you want me to just go down? From yeah, the whatever. Top? Yeah, whatever yeah. you feel. And you want to, we have, we have three minutes. So. Oh, my goodness. Three minutes. Yeah. Okay. So for the um, infusing in critical race theory, that's a tough one, you know, because I'm in California. And so I don't, I don't run into that um, problem. Um, maybe talking about current issues, you know, some of my colleagues have thought about how do you incorporate the recent shootings in Buffalo? Um you know, because it, you know, I mean, that's sort of a, an example of sort of current affairs, but it also has to do with how do we educate people um, and, and help them to understand different cultures. And I think sometimes critical race theory gets accused of that, but then you see the outcome of having not been um, shown that diversity or understanding of that diversity and how that shows up in society. So maybe that could be a good start, starting point. Um, uh, in a course that includes DEI issues, do include success stories. Yes, yes, I love. You can't just focus on the bad part because then the students of color like just feel defeated the whole semester. So you know, like it's it's hard to do. Like, okay, here's health disparity data, and here's this data, and then all of my like students of color are just like, can you please like talk about something that we do well? Um, so this, of course, is a final project data set and so it's not something that we spend the whole semester on um, but I, I try to be very thoughtful about that yes um okay and then a link for community colleges okay Karen I can think about that and then do I find support with equity oriented or, uh, organizations I haven't necessarily um reached out to them in any way I've partnered with uh, more mathematically centered organizations um like SOCNAS and the MAA and AWS AWM um but yeah yeah I think uh, there's definitely a lot of support and a lot of space for that so and I'm glad that you could join us uh thank you for all that you do